We've come together here this morning to prepare ourselves to lay to rest the body of Henry Bartels in the certainty that he is delivered from all limitations of this life and now is with the Lord in glory. And therefore, as we grieve, we do so in hope. As we come together, we can worship and we can sing and we can praise the Lord because of the life that he gives to us, also the Lord in whom Henry put his trust. And let us express it also this morning by singing together from Psalm 116, the stanzas 1, 7, and 8. We want to listen to the Word of God as it sheds the light also on our path, even when the path leads to the cemetery. The Word that speaks about God's grace and God's love and mercy for sinners. Let's read first of all Psalm 16. Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Preserve me, O God. For in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. 
The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. And therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The other reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans from chapter 8. Romans 8, starting at verse 18. Romans 8, starting at verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. And likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows What is the mind of the Spirit? Because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. In order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's what a reading from Scripture. Let us now call upon the name of the Lord in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we come to you because you are the God of life. You are the God who has made us your own. You are our Lord. We have no good apart from you. And therefore we take refuge in you. And then we know it is well. Father, what a blessing. That though we live in a world that is broken, where we long for the perfection to come, the same time we have the truth of your nearness, your goodness, and your mercies each day again. We thank you too that our lives are in your hand, that nothing happens by chance, that the hairs that we have are counted, that no one can, none can fall without your will. You have recorded the days of our lives in your book, also the days of Henry Bertels. And in your wisdom, you you determined that his service on this earth was completed. And you delivered him 
from sickness, from limitations. And you gave him that rich entry into the glory that Christ has obtained. And we thank you for that. You have heard our prayers. That he could enter into the glory and the joy of his master without the things that hindered him in this life. Father, we acknowledge your greatness, your mercy, and your love. And as we look back in our lives, we see many things that show your goodness. Father, we see your hand in so many ways, in the good days, but also in the difficult ones, in times of joy, but also in times of grief. You have been the one who goes with us. Also in the lives of Henry and Nancy and the children. Father, it was not always an easy road where you led him and Nancy and the children and the family. There were times of serious challenges, the ongoing declining strength. But Father, in all those you provided as you promised. Also in his life, you showed what you already signed and sealed to him when he was baptized, that he belongs to you. My Father, and therefore as we come to this point, we can only say that it is by grace alone and in Christ alone that we can go on. And so we thank you for what you have given in a husband, a husband who is dedicated to you, but also to the family. What you've given to in, in a father who led, who provided, who taught, in a grandfather, in a brother. And yes, it was done with many sins and shortcomings, for we all have to recognize our sin. But through our actions and what we do, In spite of our sins, you are pleased to work out your work to lead us to the glory that you have prepared for us. And so we come to you this morning, and we indeed rejoice. We rejoice that we know that what you say is true, and that the glory that we have in Jesus Christ is real, that we have life and forgiveness in him. We thank you, Father, for the care given to Henry by so many. Father, you provided also in that way. And we give thanks to you. And now we gather here in order to later on go to the cemetery, but we want to be directed by your word. And we pray that you would give us a clear understanding and comfort and direct us by the word. Open our hearts, all of us, so that we may serve you trust in you, love you, and honor you in all that we do. In the name of our Lord, we pray this. Amen. We'll sing now the English version of the Dutch hymn, Da Ruist Langs de Wolken, and in the English it is, There Rings Through the Clouds, and you have the words of the hymn in your program.
You will pay attention this morning to Psalm 78, the verses 1 through 7. Psalm 78, verses 1 through 7. The Maskeel of Asaph. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Thus far. Nancy, Wayne and Hilda, Shauna, Jeffrey and Chelsea, Sarah and James, children, grandchildren, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I love the Lord, the fount of life and grace. The words of Psalm 116, beautiful words that we could sing at the beginning of the service. It sets the tone for the service. Because we do have a difficult task. And that is to bury the body of a loved one, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother, a friend. And whenever you stand around the grave, so clearly comes to you the reality of the brokenness of life. You cannot get around it. But what is so beautiful too is that at the same time, as you stand there, you also realize the truth of God's promises. In the lives of God's children, grief and joy are not two opposites, as if you have to have the one or the other. They go together. Because in both the grief and the joy... We find our rest, we find our hope in Jesus Christ and in the love of our Heavenly Father. And that is why, though this is a difficult task, at the same time there's an element of rejoicing here. And we can sing. And we can also listen to the word to be lifted up. Because God's word is the light that we need on the path. And that is the path of life. And it is so because Jesus Christ is the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life. And his word is clear. That when we stand around the grave, he says, look at me. I went there too. I was buried. But I rose. The grave could not hold me. And therefore, hold on to me and to my word and see also where I am leading you. On March 6th, the Lord called home his child, his servant, Henry Arendt Bartels. He was allowed to enter into the glory of the Lord in whom he had put his trust. And the Lord answered your prayers, delivered him from the struggles, the limitations of this life that had made life somewhat difficult for a long time. And he was allowed to 
let go of that and to come into the glory of his master. After a lengthy and at times very difficult road of illness, surgeries, declining abilities, challenges. So for him, it's a relief to be set free from all these limitations, to be free from sin. The Lord also has taken a task away from you, from your shoulders, especially yours, Nancy, the task to care for Henry, and a task that you, could, that you fulfilled with much commitment and dedication because of the grace of God that sustained you. So even though we, in a way, are thankful for what Henry has received, yet it leaves an open place. Every death does that. No matter the circumstances, death is and remains painful because the Lord did not create us to die. He created us to live. He didn't give us bodies to suffer to be in wheelchairs, to be buried. No, he created us bodies to function well in his glory. He created us to function in relationships. And that relationship is gone. A husband, a father, a grandfather, a brother. No, we don't begrudge him his glory. But yet we need to come to terms with the open place that is there. And how we do that. You see, a funeral is, is a time in which we look back at what has happened before in the life of the one who is passed on. We look back in what God has given and his care and his love. At the same time, we look up because we acknowledge that we need his help, the Lord's help, his strength. And we look ahead at a funeral because we know about the truth that one day the trumpet will sound and, and all the graves will be opened. So we look back, we look up, and we look ahead. And we want to do that with the word of God. And this morning we do it with Psalm 78. And the passage from Psalm 78 expresses what motivated Henry in his life as he fulfilled his task at home, in his family, on the farm, in the church. And you could say it centered around those words in verse 4, that is to tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord. And it is a combination of these glorious deeds and being passionate about them and the desire to tell them that I want to highlight. The glorious deeds of God need to be retold to children, to grandchildren, and to others. Henry, especially in his good years, was a very open person. He could be frank, direct, straightforward. But it was based on that deep awareness that you have to serve the Lord in all that you do and to be true to his word. For him to trust in God, as it was on the barn, also meant to obey him. In all that you do, to show that trust in following him in all that you did. And he was not shy about it, nor was he quiet about it. He was always ready to speak, to testify, and to explain. Why? What motivated him? I said, at a funeral, you look back, you look up, you look ahead. But in a way, that is also the case in Psalm 78. If you read the whole psalm, you'll find in this psalm that there is a looking back. The history of Israel is recorded. 
human failures, shortcomings, God's faithfulness in spite of that. It's also a psalm that looks up in the sense we need help. Lord, help us in this. We need your grace. And it is a psalm that looks ahead. It looks to generations yet unborn. Now, the psalm is also a psalm of teaching. You see that in the first one? Give ear, O my people, to my teaching, and incline your ears to the words of my mouth. But that teaching in Psalm 78 is part of a chain. And the chain is made up of links, human links. Because there are the ancestors, our fathers. There is the current generation, the we. And there is the future generation, children yet unborn. So it's a chain made up of links that are humans. But at the same time, God who uses that chain to build his kingdom... And how does he do that? Well, he tells to the current generation, you who are alive, you have to know what you have received from the previous generation, what has been handed over to you. Now you have to in turn hand it over to the next generation so that yet, till on yet to be born, we'll pass it on again. And the chain will continue and the kingdom will be built and the church will be gathered. You see, the Lord is pleased to use this teaching by parents to work for further generations, future generations. And of course, that comes also with, a, with an obligation. You know, the saying that the strength of a chain depends on the weakest link. So if one link in this chain is weak or breaks, the chain fails. And that is the concern of the psalmist. He wants to make sure that each link, each generation is strong and functions well in the task to hand over what? What has to be handed over? Verse 4. The glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. The glorious deeds of the Lord, the might of the Lord, the wonders that he has done. Well, those words describe who God is and what he does. What is not his work? And that includes everything. That includes the big things, events in this world, in the history of the world, in creation, but also the very small things. The change of the seasons, the buds that lead to flowers, the animals and what they do. It's all part of God's glorious deeds, his might and his wonders. And it has to be handed over. And that means that you have to make clear to the next generation, nothing happens by itself. This world does not run as if it runs on its own. There is a God who directs, who shows, who leads. We live in a world governed by God's hand. And that is what has to be handed over. Well, that's what Henry did. In the big things that happen in this world, in the small things on the farm, point to, this is God's work. This is what he has done. God is not a God who is absent, but he is involved in what is happening in this world. And he was passionate about it. Also when it concerned himself and his health, and he was con confronted with serious health concerns, he found his strength in the mighty deeds of God knowing that it was Father's hand that carried him 
And the doctor could make all kinds of promises and all kinds of predictions, but he said only God knows. His might, his wonders, and he spoke about it. Now these words in verse 4, the mighty deeds of God, his wonders, the glorious deeds of God, are also used in the Bible for a very specific aspect of God's work, namely the work of redemption. The psalm that precedes Psalm 77 speaks about you are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the people with your arm redeemed your people. So God's mighty works, God's arm, his glorious deeds is that he set a people free from bondage in Egypt and led them to the promised land. You go to the song of Moses in Exodus 15, the song that they sang at the shore of the Red Sea, you find a similar terms. God's mighty work. That means that he loves his people so much and his faithfulness to his promises is so strong that he redeems them. He sets them free from bondage so that they can worship him and serve him. And therefore, these words in Psalm 78 about these glorious deeds of the Lord that have to be handed over is also to mean, also means that you show the next generation this is God as he redeems sinners and gathers his own people. God's amazing work. And of course, these glorious deeds of God, they point to what we remember also in this time of the year, the cross of Jesus Christ, the resurrection from the dead. You want to see the glorious power of God. Now look at the cross where the Son of God took on the greatest enemy and saved us from the curse that we deserve. That's amazing. Now that has to be handed over. And again, that is something that Henry did. He was passionate about God's work in the church and he spoke about it. But it's more here because when you compare verse 4 and verse 5, you notice there's a parallel there. In verse 4, when it comes to teaching, it says, The glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders that He has done that has to be told to the coming generation. And then in verse 5, He says, He commanded our fathers to teach to the children what? A law. So the parallel in verse 4 and verse 5, on the one hand says, tell the glorious deeds of the Lord. And then in verse 5 says, and that means that you have to teach the law of God. That's the parallel. The combination of God's mighty works and then obeying God's commandments and handing them over to the next generation. Well, that fits also the history of Israel. After they were delivered out of Egypt by God's mighty work, did the Lord just leave them there and do whatever they wanted to do? No, he brought them to Mount Sinai. And he says, now I'm your God. And this is how we can function together. This is how we can have fellowship together. This is how this wonderful relation that came about through the blood of that lamb on the posts of the door, this is how that relationship can continue. And that is why these wonderful deeds of God are connected to the law of God. And telling these wonderful deeds also means to talk about the law of God. That is why Paul in Galatians calls the law the law of freedom. The law that keeps us in the freedom that Christ has given us. A freedom given to us by the mighty deeds of God. Christ, who in our place obeyed the law of God perfectly and who gives us his righteousness so that we know that in life and in death and in body and soul, 
we belong to him. And that motivated Henry to hand over the law of God, to teach what the Lord demands of us, also meant and involved speaking about the mighty deeds of the Lord. Now, Psalm 78 also tells us that this teaching has an aim. It's not just a mechanical process. You do it and you're done with it. No, remember the chain. Each link has to function so that the next lane also, link also can function. So what, has, what is taught, what is handed over, has to be understood and acknowledged in order to again pass it on. And that is our calling. We have to work with what we have received. Verse 7 speaks about this. Tell it to their children so that they should set their hope in God. Not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That is the point. Because the next generation, you will face all kinds of challenges too. How will you deal with them? Well, then you need to work with what you have received, what has been taught about the mighty deeds of God, so that you trust in the Lord. That you do not forget His works, that you keep His commandments. And that makes this into a very serious lesson, doesn't it? Each generation is a link in the chain. But when link breaks, the chain stops. But when that link is strong, it continues. And that is what the Lord is concerned about. And he gives us a Psalm 78, and he gives parents, and he gives instruction so that it will continue by his grace. Because he has in his wisdom decided that in this way he would work out his plan and build his kingdom. For as we fulfill this, task. It is not because of us, but it's because it is all from him and in him and to him, so that all the glory goes to God alone. I said Henry was an open person, but that was based on his firm conviction of what Psalm 78 teaches and his desire to be faithful in the calling of the Lord. And may the Lord give us all, by his grace, the strength to live in this truth. Yes, we look back. We are thankful for what we have received in a husband, in a father, in a grandfather, in a brother, in a friend. We look up because in our own strength we cannot. We also look ahead, and not only to the immediate road ahead, but also to the end of the path. Because God will complete what he began. In him we trust, and it also means that he will bring to completion what he has started. Yes, we grieve. At the same time, we're thankful and filled with gratitude and rejoice in the Lord because of the mighty deeds of God. And in that certainty, we will also go to the cemetery and after that, move on again. Because the mighty deeds of God are not finished yet. One day, these mighty deeds will be shown and manifested to all creation when the trumpet will sound. The graves will be opened. Death will be defeated. Sin will be gone. All brokenness will be healed. All limitations will be taken away. Bodies that now were impacted by sickness will be perfect and whole. And we look forward to that day. In God we trust. 
in that certainty, we will bury and sow a seed in the earth that one day will yield an amazing harvest by the grace of God. Yes, we praise him, our redeemer and our creator, because his strong arm will guide us and will guide you too as you go on, because he is beside you. Amen. We will sing now, we praise you, O God, our Redeemer, Creator. And after that, we will sing to him, I will sing of my Redeemer.
Let's sing out together, When Peace Like a River.
As the oldest child, or oldest, I have been asked to speak a few words about Dad. We as children thank God for the, fa for the Father we received from Him. Effectively passing on the Christian faith, Dad received from his parents to us, his children, is something he did well. He lived out in front of us the way God would have us live each day. He was very enthusiastic about his faith and spoke about God and Jesus, it seemed like, at every opportunity he had. He witnessed to neighbors, feed salesmen, equipment salesmen, or anyone that he met as a farmer, whether they wanted to hear it or not. He spoke of the joy of being a Christian. He would often look to the night sky and point out the moon and the stars and stand in awe of the God of the universe. God gave Dad 44 healthy, strong years, but his life changed drastically when he was diagnosed with a brain tumor at such a young age. With our ages, being 17, 13, 10, and nine respectively, especially for the youngest, it is hard to recall how he was prior to his illness. The most common <clears throat> memory is having to go to the barn each school day morning to say goodbye to him before the school bus arrived. He would always say, don't forget who sees you, or don't forget you are a Christian. After his surgery and subsequent treatments, the doctors estimated he only had two years left to live but the Lord had other plans and gave him almost 34 years. For him, life was never the same though. With vision loss also came the loss of his driver's license, and if you know Bartels, not being able to drive was a big disappointment. Troubles with short-term memory, comprehension, and balance all increased rather quickly through the years. Chelsea, when dating Jeff, remembers being asked often what church she was from and whether or not she loved the Lord. Even after his illness, his zeal for the Lord never wavered. After 19 years after becoming ill, he began to have trouble walking, which resulted in him moving to Shalom, where he lived almost 15 years. He moved there before my two youngest were born and before any of Jeff and Sarah's children were born. When we think of it that way, it was a long time to live there. It was a difficult existence that he experienced there, particularly for his twin brother, Uncle Ben, who was so close to him throughout his life, this was so difficult to see. While the rest of the world went about life, he barely left Shalom. But God is sovereign in all that he does, and our dad lived out the days that were allotted to him in submission to his Savior. So we as children give thanks for the Christian father we were given, who raised us in the fear of the Lord. Looking back at his life, we see that dad, despite the difficulties he faced, through the grace of God, accomplished the goal of passing on the baton of faith to the coming generation. We as children cannot end this without mentioning the dedication of our mother throughout the years. Life was different for dad when he became ill, but also for mom. She has worked tirelessly throughout the years, remaining true to her marriage vows, caring for dad. For 15 years, she visited and cared for dad almost every day, and it pained her when she couldn't be there. She taught us to accept the life God has set before us and persevere no matter what happens in life. God brought our parents together and gave our father a wife who was dedicated and served him until his last breath. Thank you, God, for the parents you have given us. Let us reflect on this and let us in these affluent times <clears throat> not abandon the love our parents had and have for the king of the world. Let us not, like so many in our times, take for granted the glorious gospel that was handed down to us. Let us not become enthralled with the fleeting ple pleasures of this life. Let us not become lukewarm as is described in the book of Revelation. But let us rather enthusiastically tell the coming generation 
of our wonderful Savior, let us be instrumental in spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth so that the number of the elect may be full. Then our King will return and all the pain and grief will be banished and we will join our faithful ancestors in a new life, in a new world, praising our faithful Savior for what he has rescued us from. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Before we go to the cemetery, we'd like to thank everyone, family, friends, for coming and sharing in our sorrow and in our hope of the resurrection. Thank you. Let us sing now the hymn, He Leadeth Me.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and that also this morning we could open it and listen to it, that we could sing your praises and the greatness of your love and mercy. We praise you for your mighty deeds, which you so clearly have given to us in Jesus Christ, the one who died, was buried, but he rose and he lives and he will come again in glory. And we thank you for the hope that we have in him. We pray that what we heard this morning, what we sang this morning, we also be echoing in how we live and what we do, work it in our hearts by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of faithful teaching and instruction by parents, and we pray that also parents today receive the strength to hand that over, the wisdom to tell it to the next generation so that your kingdom may come. Father, we pray to be with us when we now go to the cemetery. Give us strength, and also there, We go not by what we see only, but also by what we know in Jesus Christ, in faith, in the one who rose from the dead. And that because of his grave being opened, also our graves will be opened one day. And Father, we look forward to that day. In the meantime, strengthen us to our tasks. Be with us the remainder of this day. Be also with us the weeks, the months, the years that are coming. We pray especially for Nancy. Father, will you be with her, surround her with your love and your grace and give her strength to go on to serve you in the midst of her family. Bless the children and the grandchildren. Father, be with all who are grieving. And we thank you for your word, the comfort we have, and that you are beside us in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing song is an expression of our longing for the Lord Jesus to come back. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. And let us rise to sing this hymn.